So the title of the message today is Consecration, the Power to Pursue. Consecration, the Power to Pursue. You know, as I come into this and looking at some of the directions that we're moving in, as I mentioned, we're entering into our technically 39 days or 40 days of fasting and consecration. And as we are, you know, it's kind of good to change, to, to set your mind towards uh, that period and growing and learning and increasing and healing and getting ready, really, for what's the next step in your life. It's not just a drawing back. It's a drawing back, like, like pulling back on a, on a bow. Jose, you understand that. We pull back on the bow, and I release it with power. So I'm drawing back that I might be released into something more powerful. Amen. And so we're looking at this, and, and I'll say, no matter where you are, it's a time of consecration. Now, before I even get there, that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we're called to live a consecrated life. Uh, we are to be different. We are to be new, you know, and it's not bondage, it's freedom. I'm getting freed from some old things so I can walk forward in the freedom of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that his kingdom offers. Amen. Last week, the message was about having intimate encounters with God. And, and one of the points was about being intentional, you know, about setting times aside, but making sure that I am intentionally changing my focus and setting my focus on God, setting my ear to listen in heavenly places and, and, and being intentional about growth, spiritual growth. You know, said, we are the River Church. Welcome to the River Church, where we lead the lost to salvation, the saved to maturity, and the mature into ministry. We can't do that without focus. We can't do that unless we are focused on the upward call of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And one of the points is about being that intentional, but also being hungry, you know, developing an appetite to be in his presence. How many of y'all are hungry to be in his presence? You know, the, I'll tell you what, one thing I know, I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I hunger for his presence. Amen. And when there is the presence of God, I'm diving in. I'm not running away. I'm advancing and moving forward. Amen. Matter of fact, more than that, I'm not just going in. I'm taking people with me. Amen. You know, people say, oh, you take me out. I'm taking you out with me. No, you take me in. I'll take you out with me. Amen. We're going into the deeper places with God. And, 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 and not only to be hungry for his appetite, but, but be spiritual. You know, neglected times of intimacy with God can, can stifle, can, can cause your, your spiritual growth to end and to stumble. But the opposite, that when we take those times of intimacy with him, you can expect transformation. You can expect to grow spiritually. You can expect to become mature in the things of God. Amen. So this week, we want to talk about being oriented towards seasons uh, or a season of fasting and of consecration. Now, I want to talk about consecration first. Let's bring that definition up. Amen. The definition of consecration. By the way, there's many definitions of consecration. I'm pulling this one from the Encyclopedia Britannica. How many of you know what an encyclopedia is? <laughs> yeah, a lot of people don't anymore. So I don't know. We just Google it. No, some, there was a day we had to flip the pages. Amen. And so consecration by the Encyclopedia Britannica is an act by which a person or thing is separated from secular or profane use and dedicated permanently to the sacred by prayers, by rites, and by ceremonies. So in other words, when I say I'm consecrating, I'm setting myself apart or I'm setting things apart for the glory of my God to the service of his kingdom. I know every time I buy a new car, I put my hand on that car and I consecrate that vehicle for the service of of the kingdom of God. It's set apart for the service of the kingdom of God. Amen. That there's different things. My life is consecrated and set apart for the service of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's not just a consecration of items. It's a consecration of the heart, consecration of my being. It's a consecration of my household. I mean, I could keep going on and on and on. I probably will. Amen. Because there's so many things that need to be separated from the things of this world. The dictionary gives the definition of consecration as an act of declaring something to be sacred or holy. I mean, I know we should be pursuing holiness. The Bible says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which you will not see the kingdom of God. Amen. So some synonyms for the word uh, consecration. Uh, there's some, I just kind of went through the concordance and went through some Greek and Hebrew, and, and these are some of the synonyms I came up with. Word clouds. Don't you all like word clouds? I love word clouds. Renewed. Be consecrated means I'm being renewed. 
In other words, I'm not killing it. I'm giving it life. Amen. Dedicated, set apart, perfected, ceremonially clean, morally clean, purified, sanctified, and again, holy. Praise God. That's what it means to be consecrated or to consecrate a thing or to consecrate a season or to consecrate a day, to put that thing apart, to make sure that it is set permanently apart for the things of God. You know, sometimes we get a little confused in our terminology. We read in our Bible. In some cases, it says consecrated. Other places, it says sanctified. And the two words can be used interchangeably. However, when you read the context that is actually being used in, consecration is your work. You set yourself, you set your things, you set things. It's, it's man's work to consecrate, to put it apart for God. Then God takes the consecrated thing and he sanctifies it and he sets it apart for himself. Or in other words, we are co-laborers together in Christ towards that purity, that purification, that sanctification. It's, it's, it's a work that we do. I mean, God's going to do his part, man's going to do his part, and, and men cannot do God's part and God will not do man's part. We have to pull together. Hallelujah. I felt something when I said that because there is a work that's taking place where God is pushing the, the lines and the boundaries on the lives of certain individuals. Some are here in this room today that God is beginning to do a work. He's beginning to release something inside of your life. It will not be because of your efforts. It's going to be because he has whistled and called, and he's calling for holiness in your life. He's calling for consecration. He's calling for you to be set apart, and running from him will not work. Running from him will not work. Jesus, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say amen. amen. That's a powerful word right there. Amen. Matthew chapter 23. It gives us a place where Jesus is preaching to the multitudes. And the multitudes include his disciples. It includes scribes. And it includes Pharisees. Pharisees being the leading, ruling religious party of the day. The disciples, those who are walking with Jesus. And scribes who are like lawyers. They're, they're experts in the law. And all of these are, are present at the time when Jesus is speaking. And he's pointing out the ungodly flaws in the society and the religious system that is ruled by the Pharisees. Jesus is pointing out the worldly corruptions of the Pharisee. Their eye for wealth their eye for treasure, their eye for corruption, their abuse of tradition for power and influence, and their desire for accolades. I mean, these are all things. The Pharisees were as carnal as you can imagine. And while they're doing all these things, they are unbounded. They're disconnected from the Spirit of God. And they have an inability to see the honor of God in anything. They don't honor God. You know, sometimes we can be about things and we're running through processes and we're just doing what it is that we're doing and we might be doing it in the so-called name of God, but we are disconnected from his purpose and disconnected from his plan. And the Bible literally calls that being wicked. Godlessness is wickedness. Time forbids us to run through all the details of Matthew 23 today, but as I always encourage you, go home and read it and its detail. But at this point, He's drawing attention to the Pharisees and their hypocrisy and their deceitful double-mindedness. And what he says here, Matthew 23, 23, he says, Woe, is that word, Michelle? Woe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you actors. He said, you, you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. And these you ought to have done without leaving the other things undone. So, so there's, there's something Wait, In other words, it's like uh, I'm doing all my externals. I'll bring my tithe of, of, of anise and, and, and cumin, and, and I'll bring all of that before, and everybody will see me bring my stuff in, and you all will think, well, how holy thou art. But you're, ne you're neglecting the weightier matters. They're more, more, the more important things of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. He says in 24, you blind guides, you who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. I mean, in other words, saying you're focusing on small and insignificant things without looking at the weightier matters. I mean, you just think about that as like, oh, look, imagine, imagine you, you've got a, a, a big trough and it's filled with good drink and there's a camel in the middle of it, bathing. And you're like, oh, look, there's a fly. 
And that's what he's, that's, I mean, just think about what the, the example that he's giving there. It's like this, this thing is, he's not saying it doesn't matter. He's saying it's insignificant compared to the bigger thing that is laid right out in front of you. And he continues and he says, Whoa to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they're full of extortion and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first cleanse the inside of the cup and the dish, and the outside of them may also be clean. I mean, I'm going to tell it's funny because I'm in a habit that before I will use a cup, I will always look on the inside of the cup. I, I, it's biblical, right, Charlotte? It's, a, it's in the Bible. You have to look on the inside and make sure it's good. How many times have you actually gone, whoa, I'm not going to use that. That's what a whoa is, Michelle. Whoa. There's stuff in there, right? He says to you in verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, three times. He says, You are like whitewashed tombs that indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside it's full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness or godlessness. I, 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 you know, as, as, as we look at that and as, you know, you know some, some of y'all get hungry on stuff, but I, I, I got to say this. You know, the word hypocrite, Right? People say, I don't want to go to church because there's hypocrites in there and things like that. You know, you're such a hypocrite. So let me point something out about the hypocrites that Jesus is addressing. These are people who know the truth, but yet they do other things. More than that, they're not laity, they're leaders. These are people of influence who are outwardly trying to influence people towards ungodliness for their own. Don't, did you look at me and say it sounds familiar? Don't make me, I'll come down off this. <laughs> platform. I, I, I feel you, Charlotte. I'm with you. But, <laughs> I love you, Charlotte. Amen. But you, but, but you get to that, that point where you're, you're, you're saying, you know, all of that, but it's, it's you know, and, and so sometimes we wrestle because we, we think, well, am I a hypocrite? Am I a hypocrite? Am I, you know, those kinds of things. Lord, I'd rather be a hypocrite in the house of the Lord than be a hypocrite seated in the house of Satan. Amen. At least here there's redemption. Amen. At least I can, at least I, I can fix things that are here. But, but this is what I said. I said, go for the deeper things of God. Let him fix it. Let him straighten it out. I will not run fearfully towards God. I'm running fearlessly in the direction of God. Because, as Michelle said, I trust him. Amen. Yeah. What did this say a few weeks ago? Trust equals submission. Was that one of his points? Trust equals submission. There's something that's so powerful about that. Trust God. Trust him in all your ways. He'll bring it to pass. Amen. He'll bring it to pass. Hallelujah. I think about when I look at some of the, how many moves of God were postponed. Uh, perhaps they, they were ended or, or aborted because the call, those who were called, rejected the call to intimacy with God. It was like God's calling. He's drawing. He's, he's saying, you come and get filled and be equipped. And, and we're like, no, 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 I can't be God. And we kind of walk away from things. And so, All right, well, what God was going to do, now I'm going to have to wait another year, another five years, ten years, or wait for somebody else to rise up. I, I think that there's, there's times when, when, when callings to ministry are, are, are missed and calls to move out are missed or, 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 or the, the call to become something, you know, the, the call to purity, the call to a consecrated life. We miss, we miss things because we won't walk in a place of purity towards God or we will not walk in a place of consecration. God's calling us, you know, it, it's not like you're not losing anything. What you're doing is you're making room to gain something, Amen. Imagine you had a shoebox, and it was filled to the brim, and you couldn't close it anymore with $1 bills. Wouldn't that be exciting? And they said, well, you can have these $100 bills, but you got to put them in that shoebox. Are you going to say, but my box is filled with ones. I want the ones. Or are you going to dump the box out and say, fill this thing with some hundreds? Amen. How many already get filled today? Amen. Yeah, you got to dump it out so you can get filled back up. Amen. And, and dump the old things to make room for the new things that are, are just ahead, amen, the things that God has set for me. I think of the Great Supper in Luke chapter 14, you know, where they said that all things are ready. When all things, remember that, that? The Great Supper, and, and when all things are ready, he called out, he sent his servants out to those who were invited. And he said, he said come, for now all things are ready. And, and the people were like, 
with one accord, the word says one accord, they were all in agreement. They began to make excuses about why they wouldn't come. I just got married. I, I can't come. I just bought a piece of land. I, I can't come. I just got a team of oxen, and I can't come. And it, and it raised up a rage inside the master of the house. And he said, well, well, go and get those by the highways and the byways and, and in the outward places and the hedges and, and so that there's not room in my house. And he finishes it with a word because none of those who are invited are worthy of my table. That, I, that, that particular scripture gets me over and over and over again because I hear the call of God. I hear his voice saying, come, move a little bit closer, get, draw a little bit nearer. And I know that if I say no and I, I can't, and I come up with all of my excuses, I'm missing opportunities to become new. I'm, be, I'm missing opportunities. I'm, I'm putting everything on delay. And I'll tell you what, I think my days on the earth, like all of our days, they are numbered and I don't know if you'll get them back. But I know that I'm, I'm pressing forward towards the upward call of Christ Jesus. Amen. And I, I think about those basically saying, I'm too busy. I'm, I, I lost focus or, or, or I, I think you know, I'm not ready. Or for some, it's like I'm, I'm not prepared or I refuse to be prepared. I refuse to make myself available. I want to be available for the things of God. Amen. We're talking about times of, of consecration, times of preparation. And what are these times of consecration? What are times of, of preparation or times of, of self-examination? They're times of rest. How many of y'all could use some rest? Yeah, they're times of, of rest and of building and of preparation. And so these are great times, good times, right times to examine your heart, to examine your condition, to go before the Lord with a, a quiet spirit and allow him to reveal the secrets of the heart offering comfort and encouragement. You know, sometimes you got to go before God, and I just don't want to hear what I did wrong. Lord, I need to add a boy. i got to see something I've done right. i got to see that I'm, I'm on the right path. Amen. Times when God will bring us a, a conviction, granting us. When God brings conviction that things are out of order, he's granting us, he's giving us opportunities to repent. He's giving us opportunities to, to be restored. And in any case, being able to align yourself with a move of God and find your place at the Lord's table. It's so significant for today. You know, things are going on all across this nation. If you've been following social media about the, the, the outbreak and, uh, and the outpouring and, and the revivals that are happening in different college campuses and all these other things, I look at how people are looking at it and watching us. Listen, revival happens in here. I'm not saying it's not happening out there. What I'm saying, it needs to happen in your heart. It's got to happen in your spirit. It's got to happen in places where you are, wherever two or three are gathered together in my name. He says, I am there. I am in your midst. And there's a revival happening on your road right now. You make room for it. You make room. You call out for it. You, you get to a place and say, Lord, I'm here. Fill me. I don't care if the, if the room is, is completely dry. I'm completely full. And I'm ready for a move of God. Amen. If, if, if it's just a couple of rows, then so be it. Let the fire of God come. Amen. Times of testing. I mean, I don't know times of testing will come. You're going to be challenged with some things. And sometimes it's, it's more than a test. It's, it's kind of like, you know, like, like when hard things are happening, how many times? It's just a test. It's just a test. Don't worry about it. It's just God's just testing your heart. He's testing your spirit. But have you ever been in a time where something really bad is happening, something's going down, and you can hear the voice of the Lord going, this is not a drill. Everybody at battle stations, let's go, let's go, let's go. And you're like, oh, my God. This is just a test. No, the test came before. Now comes a real trial. Now comes, now comes the time where I put my, my faith to the test. Now is the time where I need to stand because this is what God has prepared us for. You know, we ever, ever been in a place where you're like, oh, man, everything is so bad. And you're like, well, hallelujah, I'm ready for this. Let's do it. No? Y'all afraid to say that one, huh? Those days are coming, I'm telling you. And, and for many of us, they're still here. But I'll tell you what, during the time of, of testing and during this time that is not a drill, will the enemy find you sleeping and uncovered? When the floodwaters come, will he find a house that is built on the sand? When the opportunity to advance comes, will your destiny helper knock on the door and catch you unaware? When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith in the earth? Huh. I believe that's why so many are struggling today. Struggling in the area of their, uh, and of their health. And struggling in the area of finances. Struggling in the area of relationships. Why people are struggling in areas of sin that you should have conquered a long time ago. 
Why people are wrestling with powerlessness. I can't seem to get it. I can't seem to overcome. I'm stuck in this, in this place. I think, I think of the, 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 the ten virgins, the parable of the ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. And Lord, never find me, I pray, to be, to be a foolish virgin. And never, never let me be found with no oil in my lamp. Hallelujah. And these are times, and we use these times to really draw in. Forget about all these times when people tell you you don't have to. The truth is you don't have to. But God is opening doors of opportunity for you to move forward and for you to grasp it and for you to get it. And I'll tell you what, it's not just about you. Isn't that so great when you hear that? It's not all about you. It's not. I want it to be all about me. It was all about you, but now you've grown. Now it's time to put on your big boy pants and it's time for you to step up and and do the things that God has called you to do so that you can help somebody else that's in need. So you can, not just next generation young people, and next generation of those that are coming into the kingdom of God. You've got to give up your seat so the new ones can come in. And by the way, i got another seat for you. Another place for you to be. Hallelujah. As we enter into this season of consecration, we need to create opportunities for intimate moments that set our courses correct. You know, that was how we go through so much struggle, so much hardship. And it's like, okay, well, I, I'll get another job. I'll, I'll, I'll do something else. I'll, I'll try to figure it all out. When you know what their answer really is? Take some time to be with God. Take some time to worship him with your own words, with your own heart, with your own spirit. Take those times to draw nearer to him. Follow the word of God. Learn it. Memorize it. Get it into your heart and put it to work. Don't, don't be unskilled in the word of righteousness. Sometimes I cry out to the Lord. I said, I am skilled in the word. I am skilled in the word. Followed by, give me a word. Give me a word. Give me something to you. And she said, God has a sword for every situation. God has a sword for every circumstance. And my bell went off. I ran around the desk and sat back down and said, that was good. That was was really, that ministered to me. Hallelujah. But we press for the deeper things of God. We're entering into the season of consecration. We need to create opportunities, opportunities that will lead to transformation, opportunities that will lead to, think about this for a second, transformative moments. The time when you could go before God and you will say, I will never be the same again. This is a game changer. This spoke to me. This, I know something got pulled out of my spirit today, and I know that I'm being made new, and I'm not going back to what I once was. Yesterday belongs in the past, but I'm pressing forward into a new version of me, a new version of of what I am called to be and what I'm called to become. Hallelujah. Hebrews 12, 14, I love this. I quoted it earlier, but Hebrews 12, 14 says, to pursue peace with all people and holiness, without, without which no one will see the Lord looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. And I, as, as I'm looking at that, I'm saying, you know what? How do you pursue holiness? I can pursue peace. That's easy. But to pursue holiness requires intimate moments with God. It requires that I, I, I keep putting parts of my life on the sacrificial table and seeing if the fire of God will come and consume it, if he will see it as acceptable or unacceptable. And that's why I said that the, the verse is all things left behind. All things, old things pass away and all things become new till everything is of God. That's transformation. That's tra- Say that word, transformation. Hallelujah. How many are waiting to be transformed and made new? Hallelujah. So how do we have these moments? How do we create these moments of intimacy with God? Create moments for consecration in our lives. I, I, let me see I'll get through these pretty good today. Amen. Y'all pray for me, all right? We good? Y'all happy? Amen. Praise God. Number one, be watchful for movements of God. Be watchful for for the the movements of God. Be alert. Be on the watch. You know, I'm I'm looking for God. I'm looking for a movement of God. You know, there's something (laughs) earlier this week, we're at uh, at prayer on Thursday night, right? And you was there, and you were were there, right? You two in the front row. You guys were there, right? And we're there, and, and while we're praying, and I'm watching all these things happening, and in the spirit, I'm watching a tidal wave move down uh, Broadway towards, towards uh, Lafayette Square here in Havel. And I'm watching this tidal wave come down. And I was like, ah, oh, I've been imagining things. But I closed my eyes. I could see it again. I saw it again. I saw it again. I saw it again. I keep seeing it. I'm like, I think God is looking to do something here. I believe God is wanting to do something there. And, you know, it's not just information. Sometimes that's your marching orders. 
I'm watching for a movement of God, but I'm also watching and saying, you know, this is where God wants me to be and this is what he wants me to do. This is what he is asking me to believe for, not just a mental assent to believe for it, but to get on my face before him and to call it into being. Amen. We have to be watchful for movements of God. I'm watchful for movements of God. I'm watching how God is moving in certain individuals in here. I'm watching for that movement of God, and I'm encouraging it in the spirit and in the natural. That's the reality of what it is that we all should be doing. We should all be encouraging one another. We should be standing together one with another and encouraging one another to go into that deeper place we're just singing about. Take me to the deeper place and increase my faith in the presence of the Lord. Something's coming, amen. For many, it's already arrived. Are you prepared to receive a move of God? I'm going to look at Mark chapter 6. And what we're going to see in Mark chapter 6 is the sending power and the receiving power, even the power to reject the call of God in action. Mark 6, verse 7. And Jesus called the twelve to himself and began to send them out two by two. And he gave them power over unclean spirits. Many, many, many pray for the, the power for today, the power to be made manifest in them and on them and over them. But are we willing to go out with that power? God give you the, the power to heal. I can lay hands and people get healed. You'd come to church every Sunday and lay hands on, on the sick and, and see them healed. But would you go to the hospital? Would you go to people in the street? Would you go to Target and lay hands on somebody and say, be healed? That sending power comes with a willingness the ability to submit, even the willingness to fail from time to time while you are still being built up and perfected. Amen. He sent them and gave them power of unclean spirits. Verse 8, he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except the staff. That's where I got it from, Michelle. No bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics, not two coats. And I believe this was to keep them focused. This was to keep them dependent on the Lord's provision that he would be glorified, but it was also to test the houses that they would approach. Or in other words, here I come. I ain't carrying nothing with me, but I have the gospel of the Lord. Can I come in and spend time here? I'm like, no, you, you broke. Obviously, you ain't got nothing and you don't nothing we need. And he, he said, they're disqualified. But you're looking and you're testing for qualification. Verse 10, he also said, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there until you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake the dust from under your feet as a testimony against them. For assuredly, I say to you, it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. Oh, here's the big message, right? Are you ready for the big message? Yeah, the gospel comes. Amen. The gospel comes. And, and here's what happens. If you receive the gospel, you will be refreshed. If you reject the gospel, you will be rejected. Black and white, plain and simple. Here comes the gospel. Here comes the good news. Here comes the Lord. Here comes a move of God. And if you accept it, you will be accepted. You will be refreshed. You will be restored. But if you reject it, no soup for you. Amen. It's a good place for self-examination. If you're here and you've been in a place of ignoring God and rejecting the gospel... This is your day. It's your day to get to the altar. God has granted you repentance today. Amen. And, and you will not leave here in fear but, uh, or with a certain expectation of destruction, but you'll have a certain expectation of a life eternal with Him. That is the call of God. Even I've been walking with the Lord all this long, but if you're not walking today, it's a different day. Amen. We need to get restored to get right. We need to move where there's a movement of God. That we as, we as a people of God need to operate in a place of faith that does not keep us inside of protocol. There is a godly spiritual protocol which we will not break. But there are earthly protocols that say, I'm hungry enough to go and to get the thing that I need at that moment. I bind every spirit of fear right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Because hope is coming. The glory of the gospel has come. Hallelujah. And it's our day to receive it. The gospel is a message of hope for the sinner. And Jesus has come, and it's time to repent and to repair to receive a healing, restoration, and deliverance. But the gospel also comes to those who are saved. It's time to move. It's time to get it. It's time to go and to move out with it. Amen. 
Verse 12, they moved out. They went out and preached, watch, that people should repent. You see that? They weren't out there preaching, you know, have good feelings towards God. They weren't out there they're preaching, you come into the presence, you'll cry. They were preaching in such a way that you would repent. When he said repent, it means I've changed my mind. I'm leaving old things behind. That's that level of repentance. Not just like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, God. I'll try not to do it again. No, I've changed my mind. And even if I do it again, my mind is still set towards Jesus. I'm still set on that right path. Amen. Verse 13, it said they cast out many demons. Imagine that just kind of coming in and, well, I'd like to tell you about Jesus. Oh, by the way, come out of him. <laughs> and, and so it, he, and, 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 and he's come to the earth and the Messiah has come out in the name of Jesus. I'm trying to talk. Hallelujah. That kind of thing. They cast out many demons. They anointed many with oil and many who were sick and, and healed them. Why did they anoint them with oil? They were consecrating them. That's what, that's what the smearing of oil is, sanctification and, and consecration. And what happens when you, when you consecrate somebody with oil? You're making a declaration, this belongs to Jesus. This is no longer the property of Satan. This is no longer the property of this world, but this is the property of the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. And the next few verses, it shows that they were in perilous times. I mean, I don't think we live in perilous times now. Not like that. Because the next few verses talks about the beheading of John the Baptist. Literally put his head on a platter. Here you go. Oh, it's brutal. It's not happening in Haverhill, praise God. Because I'm not up for that kind of perilous time. Hallelujah. If the Lord so, so anointed me, praise God. But for now, we're not going there. But watch here. The Lord now brings something to the place where they're going village to village, two by two, preaching the gospel that people should repent. And in verse 60, it says, And the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many that were coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So let me break that down just a little bit here. The apostles are coming back. Woo, Jesus. <laughs> that was wild. We cast out demons. People got healed. Some people believed. Some people we had to shake the dust off. And, and, you know, and that's why I carried the staff so I could hit them on the head. <laughs> you know, whatever. I, don't, I, I, I have this deep theological question. Why only a staff? I don't know. I don't know. I've read some things and I just can't pull it together. That, maybe that's next week. Praise God. But I'm just thinking, he's going through this. He's telling them all, and, all, and, and Jesus says to them, all right, look, there's a lot of people that are coming and going. I've been out here preaching. People still need to be touched and healed and delivered and all of that, but y'all have put enough time in. I want you to set yourselves apart. Go get on a boat. Recover. Rest. But you see, when they were going to recover and to rest, what were they doing? They weren't going to Disney World. They were like, whew. Take a breath, get something to eat. And then it was, man, wasn't that good? They were recharging, restoring, refreshing, getting ready for the days that were yet still ahead. You, know, you keep following the story. It's like, then they got on a boat and they had to went over to Genesaret, and Jesus came walking on the water. I mean, all the crazy stuff that was going on. But they took their times of rest to build and to grow, not to take a step away. Not, not like, you know, hey, you know, I worked really hard for the Lord. Now I'm going to take a month off in sin, and then I'll repent and come back. No. That's not what it was. It was a build, because when you consecrate, it is set part eternally. It is set part indefinitely. It is, Lord, this is yours, and, and I'm throwing away the receipt, because all I have and all I am, this is yours. Amen? Isn't that exciting? So be watchful for movements of God. How many of watch for movements of God? You got to watch, not just in the natural, not just on YouTube and Facebook and all these things, don't, not just on CBN and TBN and whatever. And what you got to do as be watching in the Spirit. Lord, where are you moving today? Lord, where's the grace of God today? Lord, I, I, know you're, I know you're looking to move in this particular direction. I believe that's what you want to do, but I also see all the impossibilities. What are the impossibilities? Well, this is happening, that's happening, these things are happening. You know, this one's distracted, this one's sick. And, and so what's your job to do? Stand there and give God a detailed report of all the things that are wrong in the earth? Or is it to get on your face before God and begin to pray and intercede? I'll just pray God for Pastor Dave. Man, he was really off last week. 
I pray, I, I pray, Lord God, that you help him with the limp or whatever's going on in his life. Hallelujah. I just pray over his house and over his family. I, I, we lift up the worship to him. We lift up Gladys and, and Carmen and Alicia and June, and, and we just pray, God, over them that, that you know, that their, their slate is clean tonight and that they have a good night's rest and, and they come out with a, a glory hallelujah, you know, just whatever it is. How many of y'all do that? It's, it's, it, how many, I think it's time to turn up the gas on some of these things. It's time to you know, hey, give us a prayer list and we'll pray over that. No, go get your own prayer list. Derive it from the Spirit. Like I said, if you're praying in the Spirit, you're praying about things that you care about. You can't pray in the Spirit over things that I care about. You better bring your own fire. You gotta bring your, you gotta bring it yourself. If you don't have the burden, ask God for the burden. God, give me the fire. Give, give me the fire. I know you've called me to children and I don't like children very much, but God, I know that, that in Christ Jesus, I can do all things. I can do all things. You know, but that kind of thing. You know what? It's, there's, there's just that, you know what I'm saying? You, you, are, you, are you following me? you got to ask God for the fire. And when the fire comes, don't put it out. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Lord, I, I keep my fuel lit. I keep my fire lit. Hallelujah. You know, last week I was, I was talking to Amber, and she was with the kids, and she was with the kids again this week. I was like, tell me something good that's happening in there. Tell me something. Do you all know, know that our kids' ministry is not in there watching videos? Do you know that? Do you, do you know it's not all tablets and cell phones and, and they're learning about the things of God? I think they're talking about Cain and Abel in there this week. But last week, I, I said, tell me something good that's going on in there. She, she said, Papa, she calls me Papa. Papa, these kids are praying. They are, they, they are, they're, they're praying. I don't know if they quite got the spirit thing, but they got the mm, yes and amen down. And, and one was disappointed because they had to stop praying and they didn't pray in a particular way and started talking about all these things. I'm like going... That's what we need to hear is happening. And I also want to start hearing it happen. I want to hear someone come and say, and kids church said, well, you know, little, little, little Jojo? Yeah, he got saved today. He received Jesus in his heart. You know, this one started talking in tongues. Came out, you know, a little kid walked in there shy and quiet, came out talking about boom shakalaka. The power said me. I told him, you can't have that cookie. He said, shunda da ba That I mean, That's what I'm talking about. Amen. Father, we just lift up these kids. We lift up the next generation in the name of Jesus. My God, we ask you, greet them at a young age, oh God. Bring them into your kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heavenly places. I pray, God, over them in the name of Jesus. Keep them whole, keep them strong, keep them focused on the deeper things of God. Hallelujah. We bless you, we glorify you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So they started casting out demons and... Laying hands with oil, healed the sick. Hallelujah. Praise God. Be watchful of the movements of God. Number two, enter the seasons of rest. Enter seasons of rest, recovery, and growth. That Jesus was telling his disciples, exit the busyness and come to rest. And that's, that's one of the things that I, I think we just don't understand on a deeper level. You know, the Sabbath is about rest. A day of rest. I was telling somebody about this the other day. Why we do Saturday and, and why, 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 why don't we, we do Saturday and, 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 and we do Sunday and now the Sunday is the Sabbath. And I'm like, okay, you can understand things that way or you can take a step deeper and begin to understand what is Sabbath. Because Sabbath means I can now rest from my labors. In other words, it's not over all the hard stuff that I have to do. I'm now entering into the rest of the Lord and I'm entering into the things that he's already done. That's, in other words, every day is Sabbath. We're, we're living Sabbath. Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. Come into a deeper place of understanding. And so we enter into a Sabbath rest. We, had, we enter into a season where we can sit and breathe and recover. In other words, I got offended because so-and-so did something, something, and I know, God, I shouldn't be offended by that. I think my emotions are too high. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to take a step back, and I'm going to rest and allow my emotions to settle. Amen. To grow. We talk about spiritual growth and maturity almost every single week. And you know what? We should. Because we need to grow spiritually. We should, be, we should be striving for something more. We should be building for something better. Hallelujah. And so we start to get up into these places. But I'll tell you what, there's times where you can't go, grow if all you're doing is running. you got to pull back because you don't know what you're running towards. i got to know what tomorrow's going to look like. So I can now walk according to tomorrow, not according to yesterday or today. But I need to pull back so I can grow forward. Amen. Rest seasons are restorative seasons. Time set apart for the growth and for the recovery. Remember this principle. 
If you work through your rest seasons, the work is unfruitful. If you work through rest seasons, your work is unfruitful. Resting through work seasons brings poverty and robbery. You got to know your times and seasons. Is this a time that God has called you to rest? You need to rest because your work is not going to bear any good fruit. If he's called you, it's your season to go to work, that's not time to rest. That's when your field gets robbed. Amen? In these times of corporate fasting and consecration, every one of us should be self-examining. And when I say self-examining, I'm not talking about self-justification. I'm talking about examining yourself. Lord, examine my heart. Try me. Test me. See if there's any ungodly thing, anything filthy within me. We ought to be growing and laboring in the Spirit together. And that's important. Not just me uh, at home trying to build myself up. No, I should be building and laboring together with others. We should, be, we should be on the same mission and on the same path. We should be running in the same direction. Maybe some are out further than the others, but that doesn't mean we're not moving together in right succession, building up one another. Amen. The greatest of the greats of faith, they still search their hearts. You can't just go and like, I'm all good, man. I'm, I'm all sad. I don't sin no more. I'm all good. I mean, you know, we, we look at Jesus. How many of y'all know Jesus didn't sin? Y'all know that? Do you believe that? Do you also believe he was tempted? Yes, he said, but in all ways, he was tempted. There's nothing new. Je- Jesus withstood it all. So, so it's even at a point where Jesus has to at time go, had to at times on his earth go, am I still good? Am I still on par? I know the, the devil's coming again, and this time the temptation is. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, your will be done. There are times, that even in Mark chapter 6, we're just talking about where they're coming and all the chaos is going on. He told the disciples, you guys go and rest. You pull yourself aside, get in a boat, go on a cruise, do something. And Jesus said, I'm going to the mountain to get my rest. And that's when he went out and met them on the waters. It's your rest in the things of God, amen. How much more when we're laboring in the things of the world do we need to rest from them and enter into the time of rest in the Lord. I mean, there's times I know, even as a pastor, there's time before I was a pastor, but even as pastor day, I'm out here running, 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 and then I can feel my spirit getting weak, getting frail, getting tired, or getting stale, stagnant. It's like, oh, you preach five days a week. I said, yeah, but it was, it was not the anointing that I need. It's not what I'm looking for. It's not the, you know what I'm saying? And we get into that. So we're out sometimes, some of y'all got some rough jobs too. Teachers and nurses. And I'm thinking, about, you know, y'all do some stuff that I, I don't think I could stand up in this. But I tell you what, those are things at times you need to pull back also so you can be healed, so you can be restored, so you don't, you don't end up building up bitterness and letting bitterness act out someplace else where it doesn't belong. You've got to continually cut the root of that away. Because, so, you know, I mean, God's planting seeds, but there are other people out just planting seeds as well. Read your Bible. It will tell you about it. Amen. But we need to rest from the corrupt morals of this world, the evils of this world, the pressures of the present works. There's times we need to go and have our resets. And a lot of times, I know people, I know people that are just news junkies. Y'all know news junkies? They have the hardest time being Christians. They, they, they're sitting there continually just being bombarded with negativity, with lies, with ungodly concepts and ideas, and the only thing they can do is keep proliferating that. But you... Have not so heard Christ. You have not so received Christ. Your job is to be a heavenly gospel news junkie. Hear about the good things that are happening in the kingdom of God, and you talk about that. You proliferate that. Did you hear all the terrible this and that? And I'm like, no, I did not, and I don't want to. What I want to tell you, though, is that there's an answer and that there is an escape. They may have a rule and a reign over that territory, but that's only till the sons of God make themselves know. All of creation is waiting for the sons of God to be revealed. I mean, that's what the Word of God tells us. My God, get me ready, consecrate me, and reveal me. Hallelujah. Enter these seasons of rest and recovery and growth. Number three, submit to the nature of God. When we talk about submit, what am I submitting to? Just do everything God wants you to do. No, not enough. Y'all catch that? Are y'all still with me? Lewis, you with me? Say amen. Louder. Hey, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Submit to the nature of God. James 4, 6, look what it says here. Y'all know this, but I want to break it down a little bit. God resists the proud 
and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Isn't that good news? You know, submit to God, right? And, and resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, so when it says to, to submit to God, right, it, it's not like I'm just, okay, I'm going along with it. No, it, it, it can be translated as subordinate yourself. Or in other words, Jesus, you take the first chair, and I'll take the second chair. Right? The old song, Jesus, take the wheel. Now, it doesn't mean you take your hand off it. I mean, he's going to teach you to drive. Right? It, it means I'm, I'm submitting to the nature of him. So in other words, when I submit to him, I'm receiving from him. I, I do what he's doing. I go where he's pointing. And now I become, he's the head, and I'm not the body. Amen? I'm a part of the body. Amen? Think of yourself as the body of Christ. So you subordinate yourself. Or in other words, stop arguing and trying to understand every little thing. All right? That's why I said take the second chair. Allow his nature to take the wheel. As born-again believers, we have his nature, but it's being formed on the inside of you. So your job is to yield to him. Very, very powerful when we begin to understand. I know last week I, I had a statement that I made about when you are, 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 are facing and you're confronted with things in the word that you don't understand, don't argue and try to take it away. Look at it with a sense of awe and of wonder and aspire to understand. Don't try to knock down all the logic, but aspire to understand. Lord, help me understand. And by the way, that happens when we take these intimate times with God. You're saying, you'll be praying about something all. We already talk about the neighbor's dog. Lord, I just pray over uh, uh, Fluffy. And, and, and God begins to speak something on the inside of you. And it's like, you know, I was studying that in the Word, but it never made sense before. But suddenly it makes sense. I've got it. I understand it. He said, resist the devil. Resist. What does resist mean? It means to oppose. Stand against the devil. Not a passive like, eh, leave me alone. It's like, no. I draw the line here. Devils don't reign past this doorstep. Y'all have your fun out in the park, but this is my house. So stand against the devil. Now, now, and notice, I mean, if you look at it, it didn't say stand against Satan. It says stand against the devil, Diablos, right? Specifically, Diablos is a lying spirit. It's an accusing spirit, a slandering spirit. And so this is addressing not only the spirits like beings, but the spirit of behavior. It's a behavior about lying and, and a behavior about, about evil speaking and, and causing division. And so also I did, and I was, I was reading this, I've done some research, and you can back this out or not. I mean, I, it's up to you. But this was the translation I came up with. Resist the devils, plural. They will flee from you. But there's a plurality of behaviors. There's a plurality of spirits. You resist them, and they will. In other words, I resisted that one, but I'm still having problems. You didn't risk them all. You, you, you only, you, you're, 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 you're fighting a fraction of the battle. You know, it's like that. How many watch the Super Bowl? Or any football game. doesn't really matter. But imagine if they only gave attention to one player. He threw the ball to another one. Yeah, but we tackled him. Yay. Meantime, the other one's running across the, the finish line, right? Not so in the kingdom of God. Not in your house. You got to be aware of the things that are happening around you. And better yet, you got to call a, a better defensive team to the line. Christian, what did you tell me the other day? You said, the game is won by the defense. Did I quote that right? That's right, because he's a defensive player. That's why. A lot of people would argue with you, but not me. I learned everything I know about football from Christian. <laughs> Praise God. The point is submission versus resistance. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You submit to God, not to devils. Don't throw your hands up and say, I quit and I give up. And by the way, some have done just that. Don't do that. If, if you're not resisting, they've got you. And how can they have you if Jesus got you? Amen. First Peter 2 says this, coming to him. Jesus as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones are being built together a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up what? Spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. So we understand the word of God calls upon us to be living sacrifices. Are you a living sacrifice? 
offering up spiritual sacrifices. Or in other words, you've got to remember, we have the priesthood of the Lord. We're the New Testament priesthood of the Lord. And so we're offering up spiritual sacrifice. And we're offering up spiritual sacrifices. We're dealing with justice. We're dealing with mercy. We, we are, are going before God. And, and, the, and the living thing is you. You are that living sacrifice that goes upon the altar. Amen. That brings yourself. So, so if, we're, if they're spiritual uh, sacrifices, then they are sacrifices that are acceptable unto God. I don't have to worry about if my sacrifice is acceptable unto you. In comparison, you're easy to please. But God has something that is only acceptable to him, and the only way that we can offer that is by faith, by belief, by increase, and by growth. Hallelujah. Psalm 51 is a good chapter that deals with consecration. David, David talks about his origin points. He talks about where he came from. He said, I was conceived in sin. Whoa, I'm, I'm no good, dirty dog. But yet he goes to God and he says, purify me, wash me and make me clean. Psalm 51, verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7, he says, purge me with hyssop that I might be clean. Wash me that I might be whiter than snow. Verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. This is a man that is crying out and saying, I know who I really am. I know the man in the mirror. I know where I'm coming from, but yet I submit myself to God and I ask you, Lord God, take all that ugly away. Purify this man. Hallelujah. He says in in verse 16, he says, you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. Or in other words, it's not about all the ritualistic things that he was called to do in his day. He could see past that into tomorrow and say, God's not after the cow. He's after the man. He's after the heart of the man. He said the sacrifices of God are what? A broken spirit. Let Let me clarify that not dashed and broken into pieces, but like a wild Mustang running out in the field and somebody goes and they bring it into subjection. A, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, a penitent heart. These things, oh God, you will not despise. So what's the target? What are we aiming for? A broken and contrite spirit, a broken, penitent heart. Praise God. Go for time here. We've got a few more minutes. Let me give you my last point today. Consecrate God's way. When you consecrate, it's not what you're going to do in your own way. And I think this is a, a problem that we have a lot in the church in general. It's kind of like, Lord, I will only give you this, I will only go this far. You know, like I said, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in pre consecration consecration. And my, my place of pre-consecration, consecration is where I say, Lord, all I have is yours. What do you want? Here's the draw. Take the stuff out that you want, right? Here's, here's all of me, Lord. What is all that you want? And then, you know, most of the time when the Lord answers, you're not like, well, I want you to give up sugar. No. Not usually, not usually yet. I mean, sometimes it is because, you know, yeah. welcome to my world. It's not about bread and those kinds of things. It's not, well, I just have some broth or whatever. God's not after the physical. He's after the spiritual. And God says, it's not just about your spirit. It's not just about your needs because you are part of a body. The body has needs. You have individual things, but the body has needs. And and, and you know what? This might mess with your theology. God has needs. God needs his body to reach out into the world. God needs his people to function as his body in the earth. And he is sending. That there is a spirit of sending. Jesus sent out the disciples to all the villages because Jesus wasn't going to the villages. I'm going to stay right here because this crowd needs my attention. But y'all go. There's a sending out that God is doing through all of this. And as every year we walk through and begin to look at the, the, the fasting and the consecration. And we'll do various studies at times on Isaiah chapter 58. But look what he says here. Isaiah 58. We're going to look at the four verses uh, 6 through 9. Isaiah chapter, eight, chapter 58 verse 6. 
He says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. What's that talking about? It's talking about being free from sin. It's talking about closing the gap, the distance between man and God, and freeing other people to do the same. That the, the, the bondage is that of sin. The bondage is that of an ungodly world view, or un an ungodly world view concept. And we have, to we have to separate ourselves from that. You know, you look, and, and, and I don't know how many of y'all are, are TV nuts and, 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 and things that you watch for your entertainment, but you got to realize most of that has nothing to do with God. All things originate with God, but a lot of things have diverted from God. And the morality that we must put on, remember, being consecrated means I am ceremonially clean and morally clean. I'm consecrated, it means I've separated myself from these outside ideals. And now I can focus on the things of God without distraction. Amen. Verse 7, he said, Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring the poor to the house who are cast out? Now, this is powerful. First of all, share your bread with the hungry. This is something that I like to do on a regular basis. And God rewards this powerfully. It's like, you know what? You see somebody who need help. Them. If I'm fasting, my food budget went from here. Well, I eat a lot. So down to there. All right. And I say, well, in the budget, that money that I'm not spending on food, this needs to go to the poor. This needs to go to someplace else or someone else. We talk about first fruits of time. I receive first fruits. Oftentimes, the first fruits go through me and out to people with needs. Don't think I'm pocketing at all. But I, I'm, I'm giving outwardly. And God always blesses that. He always blesses God. I mean, you know, God blesses people who come into alignment that way. He said, and bring, and bring them, and, bring, and go to the house, and, and, and bring to the house the poor who are cast out. And so this is what we got to understand. We're talking about the household of faith. we got to be praying in the Spirit, and we draw near those who have been cast out and are far from the things of God. Or in other words, yeah, please bring them to church, but better yet, bring them to Christ. Bring, bring, bring them to a place where they can know Jesus. These are those who are, are poor in spirit. They, they, they don't know where they're going, what they're doing, but they need to be brought into the household of faith. There's answers there. Amen. He said, when you see the naked, you cover him. What's that? That's intercessory prayer. You see somebody who's uncovered, you cover him up. Amen. Intercessory prayer. You, you pray in the spirit. And, and this is what I say too, for a lot of people here, you might pray that intercessory prayer intercessory prayer, master intercessory prayer. Make it your point to say, you know what? I'm going to do this better. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to go before the Lord, and he's going to show me how to be a great intercessor. And that's where we go. And by the way, also, when you see the naked that you cover him, one of the things that we do when we're on our fast, I know we do this as we go through the closet, we clean it out, and we give it to the poor. We get rid of, we get rid of stuff we're not wearing. We get rid of some old things, but we also get rid of some pretty decent stuff. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like, okay, well, I don't wear these anyways. They're full of holes and all that. I'll give that. Where's the honor in that? Somebody has a need for it, don't get me wrong. But where's the, honor, where's the honor in it? Yeah. The honor is, all right, look, here's, these, are, these are brand new. I wore these things twice. How many of y'all got stuff you wore twice and put it back in the closet and never wore it again? You all know, lowering your eyes. You don't want to make eye contact. I saw you. Get that to somebody who needs it. Amen. Get rid of the $1 bills. Let it be replaced with them hundreds. Amen. And hide not yourself from your own flesh. <laughs> your flesh is the body of Christ. You hear me? Hide not from your own flesh. Or in other words, oh, what have we got, five Sundays in this time period? Don't miss church. Stop hiding from your flesh. Come and get engaged in the things of God. Come out to discipleship. Come to prayer. Come, come and get engaged. You know, we're, we're, we're just talking about this when, and the great revivals are breaking out at the college campuses and all these things. And, and I, was, I was having a dialogue, a couple conversations. I said, remember when that was the normal? Now we call it revival. Because right? we can barely sit still for two hours on a Sunday morning now. But God deserves so much more. He's calling us to something so much more. Anybody, you hear the call? You hear the calling? Somebody's calling my Lord, Kumbaya. <laughs> Don't hide from the flesh. Go back to James chapter 4 and read about loving the brethren. We get to that part of draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. You go down a few verses and it's talking about loving the brothers. 
right after he talks about, about uh, resisting the devils. And then he gives the evidence that that's what he was talking about. And do not lie about the brethren. Do not talk bad on the brethren. What happens when you do all that? Look at verse 8. Then your light will break forth like morning. Hallelujah. Your healing shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer, and you will cry, and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst and the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness, there's breakthrough when we come and we do it God's way. And one time I, I realized, and we got breakthrough early. You know, sometimes we go through and like, this, this is my period of fasting and consecration, whatever. And you're two weeks in and everything breaks forth exactly what you're waiting for. And people say, whoo, I just feel such a release. I'm going to just break and stop doing that. But God gave you the release so you could press further. So you could push on. So you could help somebody else. People are like, no, I'm out. Thank you very much. Good night, Seattle, right? No. It's time for us to get our mindset into a place where we're serving God and we're serving one another. Trust God to care for your needs when you are pressing into a place of obedience together with him. And I believe, and I've said this several times, and and I'll keep saying it, this is urgent for somebody today. This is urged. Somebody today needs this touch. Somebody today needs to, to get right with the Lord. Somebody needs to, 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 to put away their childish things and put on, their, put on their, their adulthood, their manhood, their sonship in the Lord Jesus Christ because the time is urgent. The day is desperate. But these, this is the promise of breakthrough. And God's calling you not to a place of, uh, of death and emptiness, but into the fullness of life. Everything that God's bringing us. Amen. So hold fast to these things. This is somebody's day today, amen. So I want to close here as we prepare for the baptisms. But as I do, I want us to to take a few moments and pray over this time and over this season. First, hallelujah. Hallelujah.